good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lori Berman. I'm Vice President of Membership and Development for the Small Business Association of Michigan. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Special thank you to our presenter, Bill Krause. And I'll introduce Bill to you in just a second. Before we do a couple of housekeeping items, today's webinar will be recorded. It'll live on both Facebook and on Zoom, so you'll be able to watch it later. We will share the slides with you if our speaker is able to share those with us. Also, wanted to let you know if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A section of Zoom today. Do not put questions in there related to loans or other things. If you keep today's questions focused on Bitcoin and blockchain technologies, we would be uh, very appreciative. So we'll go through your questions as we go along. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Please do use the Q&A feature. Today's webinar is part of a series. We have many webinars in the month of May, and we hope you'll check the SBAM website for more. So without further ado, let me introduce to you uh, William Krauss. Bill is a shareholder and practicing at the Butzel Longs Ann Arbor office. He's a practicing lawyer at the Butzel Long Ann Arbor office. Bill represents individuals and businesses involved in governmental and regulatory investigations, U.S. state and federal litigation, and alternative dispute resolution. He concentrates his practice on disputes relating to the financial industry with a particular focus on legal and regulatory issues related to digital assets, uh, assets such as Bitcoin and blockchain technology. Bill, we are really happy to hear you, have you here today. Uh, we thank you for uh, bringing this information to our members. This is not a subject we've talked about before, so I am looking forward to hearing more about that. And if we'd like to start the slides, I think we can get going today. All right, so let me see if I can do this here. Yep. All right, Lori, can you see my, my slide? I absolutely can. Thank you, Bill. All right, awesome. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Lori, for that introduction and for the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Uh, as Lori said, my name is William Krause. I'm a litigation shareholder at Bustle Long, practicing out of the Ann Arbor office. And I specialize in disputes related to the financial industry. And I've been fortunate for the last four years or so to been advising businesses and individuals regarding legal and regulatory issues in the digital asset space. So, you know, in preview today's webinar, my goal today is to provide everyone with an easy to understand overview of Bitcoin, which is the most well-known digital asset, blockchain, which is the equally important technology upon which Bitcoin is based, and potential applications for businesses. Um, as Lori said, we want this to be useful for everyone, so please do not hesitate to post questions as we go along. I'll do my best to answer those in either real time or more likely at the end of the presentation. Um, I should also note that you know, the whole presentation is really going to be structured to presume no knowledge. So you know, if you don't know a, a Bitcoin from a Dogecoin from Ethereum or, or blockchain, that's fine. Um, this webinar is really designed to just provide a, a really sort of basic intro to those topics. Um, and as Laurie touched upon, you know, this wouldn't be a good legal presentation if I didn't offer a disclaimer. So I would like to also remind everyone in the audience that today's webinar is strictly being provided for informational purposes. It's not create an attorney client relationship with me or but so long and should certainly not be construed as legal advice. Uh, when I'm with that out of the way, let's get started. So I'm going to go to the first slide here. All right. So if you're here today, I'm assuming it's because you have an interest in learning more about Bitcoin and blockchain, which I think is fantastic. At this point, most people have at least heard of these concepts and many people already have an idea in their head about what Bitcoin really is. Now, in my experience, most people new to this technology have one or both the following opinions on the matter. So don't feel bad if this is you first, and this is one of my favorite pictures of all time, is people believe that Bitcoin is magic internet money. Um, the magic internet money set believes that Bitcoin is some sort of internet currency that lives on computers and cannot be explained to anyone without a PhD in computer science. These folks may believe that the value of digital assets like Bitcoin is not real and it's just another fad. 
Uh, finally, the Magic Internet Money Group believes that there really is little, if any, practical value to digital assets and that they are primarily used to buy, I don't know, things in video games or something like that. A second, on the other slide, you see uh, the cohort that I, I say is the Bitcoin is bad group. Um, about a year ago, I was speaking to an attorney at another Michigan law firm about why I think folks might be interested in digital assets. And he observed that he thought even Pablo Escobar needed a way to move his money. And the Bitcoin is bad track is essentially there's some variation of the following. Bitcoin is the preferred currency of drug dealers, arms dealers, money launderers, computer hackers, maybe computer science PhDs looking to buy bootleg movies. They think Bitcoin is probably illegal. I'm going to put this up. It's not illegal. Or maybe it should be illegal. Um, another misconception that's gaining a lot of traction recently is that Bitcoin is bad for the environment. That also is misplaced. And in other words, the group believes that Bitcoin is scary and risky and should be avoided. This is what people think Bitcoin is. Let's talk about what Bitcoin actually is. All right, so in late 2008, an anonymous individual or perhaps several individuals under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto released a nine page white paper entitled Bitcoin, a peer to peer electronic cash system. It's all it was, nine pages that if you ask my opinion, kind of change the way we think about things. The paper proposed an electronic payment system that would eliminate the need for central authority while using technology to ensure the payments would be secure and verifiable. So that's a mouthful. What does it mean? Well, the system allowed for the first time ever value to be quickly transferred around the world between parties who need not know or trust each other without a governing third party, like a government or a bank. So what's Bitcoin? Well, Bitcoin is the term that's given to the transferable digital token at the heart of Nakamoto's payment system. But at the same time, Bitcoin is sometimes used to refer to the Bitcoin network. Let's go over some basics of Bitcoin. First, you understand there are no physical Bitcoins. You cannot hold one in your hand. Rather, Bitcoin is a unit of digital currency that can be held or traded between users. When you think of Bitcoin in terms of whole numbers, one Bitcoin, 10 Bitcoin, it actually is divisible to 100 millionth of the Bitcoin. That's called a Satoshi. Users hold their Bitcoin electronically in programs called wallets. Wallets can be thought of something like a bank account, and they're identified by a string of numbers and letters known as a public wallet address. Now, if someone wants to send you Bitcoin, you just provide them with your public wallet address, just as you would provide someone your bank account number to receive a wire transfer. And similar to a bank account PIN, Funds in a public wallet can only be accessed by using the private key, which is known only to the Bitcoin holder and somewhat similar to your signature. I want to be clear, there's no inherent value to Bitcoin. Um, you can't melt one and make jewelry with it. You can't pour it into your car's engine. Rather, Bitcoin has whatever value the market is willing to attach to it. And at, that, at this moment in time, I think the value is about $55,000 per Bitcoin. So how do we classify it? Well, Bitcoin was the first and most well-known example of cryptocurrency. And while that term might sound intimidating, cryptocurrency is simply a name for a class of digital assets based on a system of cryptography, AKA code solving. And to be clear, I use the term digital assets because not every digital asset is a cryptocurrency. There's all sorts of different types of digital assets. Bitcoin is just one. Some are entirely speculative, others are similar to securities, for example, representing an investment in an enterprise or a business, and still others are designed never to go up and down in value. Those are called stablecoin. There are numerous other examples. But for simplicity's sake, let's stick with this introduction to Bitcoin. So aside from sounding like magic internet money, what else should we know about Bitcoin? Well, it's very important to understand the decentralization aspect. What does this really mean? Well. Bitcoin does not have a central authority or a server, you know, anywhere hidden in a vault underneath a mountain. It's not controlled by any government. That would be an example of a centralized currency. Rather, Bitcoin relies on a community of peers, you, me, anybody, for its creation, record keeping, and the verification of transactions. Another important thing you need to understand is that Bitcoin is based on technology known as blockchain. Specifically, Bitcoin's blockchain is a publicly available ledger that provides a permanent record of every Bitcoin transaction that's ever taken place. Each block constitutes a series of transaction records which builds on the block before it. Taken together, these blocks form a permanent chain showing the entire history of Bitcoin. In this way, blockchain can really just be thought of as blocks of information strung together on a chain. 
We'll talk a little bit more about blockchain later in the webinar, but for now, some important things to understand are that records in a blockchain are generally permanent, secure and tamper resistant, and can be either public, like Bitcoin's blockchain, or private. So how does Bitcoin's blockchain really work? Well, another key point to understand is that Bitcoin's blockchain relies on a system of miners who confirm the legitimacy of each transaction before it can be added to the blockchain by solving a complex puzzle. By design, this verification requires a significant amount of computing power in exchange for their participation in the process, which anyone with a computer um, and the software can participate on, you, me, anybody, the first miner to correctly solve the puzzle has the opportunity to earn Bitcoin, which is automatically created by the system as a reward. I want you to keep that part in mind, because I'm going to talk about it in a little bit. So this is how Bitcoin actually comes to be. Just like someone mining gold in Alaska, people across the world are expending significant time, money, and effort to mine Bitcoin using computers and to add it to the system. So what's an example of a Bitcoin transaction? Well, let's say that I want to exchange some Bitcoin with someone in the audience, say Lori. And let's say that everyone else in the audience are miners. Well, in this example, I'll have two Bitcoin to start. In the first transaction, I send one Bitcoin from my public wallet to Lori's. Now imagine that every transaction that occurs, whether it's to me, to, from me to Lori or anybody else is public and perfectly visible to everyone else watching. And that would be the miners. So watching this transaction, if the majority of you miners agree that I actually sent one Bitcoin from my wallet to Lori's wallet, that transaction is permanently added to a copy of the ledger that each one of you miners have. Likewise, there'll be a permanent record in the blockchain that I now have one Bitcoin in my wallet and Lori has one Bitcoin in her wallet. Let's say that I then try to send two Bitcoin to someone else, but I only own one Bitcoin because I gave the other one to Lori. This is commonly referred to as the double spend problem and has sort of vexed folks trying to come up with payment systems for a very long time. How do you do this without a centralized authority to confirm whether I have the Bitcoin or not? Well, Bitcoin's blockchain does this verification and looks back through all the records, the transactions on the blockchain to determine how much block Bitcoin I actually possess. Will I be allowed to spend Bitcoin I already sent? No, I won't. Moreover, every miner has a complete copy of the ledger and every transaction will be checked and confirmed throughout the history of block Bitcoin to double check that I have the Bitcoin I intend to send. They will see that I've already sent two Bitcoin, the transaction will be rejected, will not be added to the current block of transaction records. So then what if I try to send a Bitcoin using Lori's wallet address? Once again, this won't work. The transaction will fail because I do not possess her private key, of which there are an unfathomably large number of potential combinations, roughly one followed by 77 zeros. So what's the big deal? Well, against this backdrop, Bitcoin really is a tremendous innovation for several reasons. First, as I talked about, this technology allows anyone with a computer to participate in the validation of these transactions, decentralization. This is something that has traditionally only been occupied by a government or a financial institution like a bank. Transactions are also mathematically verified. This is much easier than detecting something like counterfeit cash or metal plated in gold. There's also no need for a central government or financial institution to oversee it. And as long as a single copy of the blockchain survives on someone's computer somewhere in the world, transactions can continue to be validated. In other words, it's censorship resistant. Next, it allows folks to send funds to one another without knowing or trusting each other. If you ever hear the term trustless, it doesn't mean that Bitcoin can't be trusted. It just means that that trust is not required for me to transact with someone. The system polices bad conduct by design and it allows transactions to happen almost instantaneously to entities anywhere around the world. It's also extremely portable, unlike say, you know, $55,000 worth of gold or US dollars, that value and much, much more is just data. It gets extremely portable. Next, it provides an immutable public record of funds that have been sent, earned, or received throughout history in a format that is extremely difficult to modify or cheat. And the last component is Bitcoin is very unique because of its scarcity. What does that mean? Well, by design, there can only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. 
of which 18.7 million or so, approximately 89% already exists. Well, how? Well, when I talked about mining earlier, I said that the reward for successfully solving the puzzle, the first one who gets it right, is the opportunity to earn newly created Bitcoin. Well, by design, the amount of Bitcoin created and then paid to miners will be cut in half at regular intervals. This is called a halving. Every 210,000 blocks, this takes place. Now, in 2009, the reward was 50 Bitcoin. Today, it's about 6.25. Eventually, the amount of Bitcoin created by mining will reduce to zero and no new Bitcoin can be created. At that point, there will only be 21 million Bitcoin in existence. This is expected to happen around 2140. And if you think about it, this is really unlike a lot of different assets. For example, fiat currency like the US dollar can simply be generated in greater supply by the government, just print more of it. Similarly, it is very difficult to estimate how much gold or oil may exist or may be discovered in the future. For obvious reasons, if there was a new massive store of oil discovered or say, you know, there was an asteroid that passed by that was made of pure gold. I mean, not to go too far flung, but the fact of the matter is we don't really know how much of these commodities are out there. We try to estimate, right? And that really has a significant impact on price. If a lot of it's discovered, this would negatively impact those commodities value. And in part, the scarcity is why some individuals and businesses consider Bitcoin to be a long-term investment, like land or art. It's one of a really only a handful of truly scarce assets. I'm going to talk about that investment argument a little bit later when uh, we touch upon sort of the reasons a small business might be interested in digital assets. Historically speaking, you know, as we're talking about investments, Bitcoin has actually performed pretty well as an investment. Um, it's gone from being essentially worthless back in 2009 to worth nearly $55,000 today. And some fun facts that I like to think about sometimes are if I would have put just $50 in Bitcoin when I graduated law school in May 2009, I'd have about half a billion dollars today, billion with a B. Um, now, as upsetting as that is, another fun fact is that the first known commercial transaction involving Bitcoin was the purchase of two Papa John's pizzas in 2010 for 10,000 Bitcoin. That would be about 55 sorry, not 55, $550 million today. So now that we have an understanding of Bitcoin and Bitcoin's blockchain, let's talk about the implications and use cases for blockchain outside of Bitcoin. Now, first, an important thing to consider is that while Bitcoin's blockchain is decentralized and public, a huge number of businesses and industries have developed centralized and private blockchains for their own use. That means whereas with a decentralized blockchain like Bitcoin, everybody in the public could see it. Centralized means that, you know, it might be limited to a C-suite of a company or, you know, a lawyer, an auditor, and, you know, the CEO of a company, whatever. It's, it's private. So let's consider some potential applications I have here. Um, first, automotive. Now, an example I like to give is say your company manufactures, whatever, transmission systems. What if there could be a blockchain containing the complete history of every transmission that your company manufactured? A record of the customer order was one record in the block. Then next was the information regarding the sourcing of various components, precisely sequenced to show when each component arrived, where it went, and where it ended up. Then there might be records for each step of assembly, showing maybe timestamps, information regarding the employee or machine involved in that part of the process. There might then be records about shipping from the single transmission component leaving an assembly line to being put on a truck for shipment to arriving to being installed in a car, just as an example. And at some point, the technology might even evolve to a point where records would continue to be generated showing usage of the transmission, servicing, or call work, errors and failures. Now imagine those records say something that could be read and, and picked up by you know, scanning a code, like a barcode on the side of the transmission component could not be easily or secretly changed by any one actor. Say for example, the shipping company, a purchaser or an end user. It could be validated, designed on a predefined algorithm as opposed to relying on someone to create a manual data record. And they could provide a comprehensive audit trail accessible in real time by various partners. What could be done with that kind of technology? How would that improve efficiency? Let's talk about some real world examples. 
Um, Bosch has explored the use of blockchain via an app to check and verify odometer data as a means of preventing odometer tampering and fraud. Daimler has done a lot of interesting work in this area as well. For example, studying blockchain network to enforce supplier contractual obligations. Um, Ford has done a lot of stuff in this space. And one that was interesting to me is they conducted a years long study on how blockchain can be paired with hybrid electric vehicles and geofencing technology to compile data about vehicle use and air quality in city centers. There are many, many others and automotive industry is just one example that of an industry that's exploring this. Um, another example is healthcare. Um, one sort of uh, thought provoking idea is what if every health record you ever had from birth forward was contained in a single blockchain record? What if your doctor could quickly reference that blockchain and review symptoms, illness, and vital signs over the course of your lifetime? What kind of improvements in care and efficiency might be yielded if the doctor or your healthcare professional could quickly pull up that data and see, for example, how your blood pressure has changed throughout the entirety of your life? Um, you know, weight, height, any sort of metric, all stored in one place that could be quickly referenced, you know, and compared to give you the best treatment. On the other hand, what kind of privacy implications would that create? What if your insurance company or employer wanted a copy as well? well those are just some of the legal issues that we're gonna to have to start to consider. And for what it's worth, I mean, this isn't hypothetical. Um, you know, during COVID over the last year, we've seen governmental and private organizations utilize blockchain to track outbreaks in real time, to assist with contact tracing, and track vaccine development and distribution. One interesting example is with regard to refrigeration. Um, you might have heard that some vaccines must be kept in very cold temperatures prior to use. One actual use of blockchain technology is that there were hospitals in the UK using blockchain to create a permanent tamper-proof record of temperatures within refrigeration units holding these vaccines. In other words, the blockchain was used there to indisputably prove that the product of the vaccine was handled correctly at all times. Um, you can obviously see how that might have some real business implications. Um, here's another example. You might have heard of smart contracts. Um, really all that is is just another application of blockchain technology. Imagine a contract able to independently and objectively verify whether a condition had been satisfied. For example, a shipment was received on May 4th and respond accordingly, say by automatically paying damages from funds held in escrow if it wasn't received on time, all without the need for lawyers or litigation. Imagine what we could do without lawyers. This is just a potential application of blockchain technology for which we largely have Bitcoin to thank. And here's a bonus application um, that I think is timely, NFTs. So, you know, if you've been reading the news, if you really sort of have had any exposure to the outside world, notwithstanding COVID over the last six months, you probably have heard the term NFTs. And, you know, a little bit of a joke there is, you know, I'll say it's a non-fungible token, but I just define something folks don't understand with, with a new term that isn't really understandable either. So I'm going to break it down a little bit. So NFTs are having a bit of a moment. It stands for non-fungible token. What does that mean? Well, fungible just means something that's able to be replaced by something similar or identical. So like a dollar bill, it's not exactly identical, but if you give me $1 bill, I can give you one and it pretty much has the same effect. Um, NFTs by comparison are digital assets that cannot be replaced by another identical item. In short, it's a digital file that is unique and or one of a kind with a certificate of authenticity built into the code, essentially. Let's give a couple examples. So artwork. Um, well, traditionally we think of artwork as something created by an artist and typically represented in a physical form like the Mona Lisa. That said, throughout time, forgers have replicated famous artwork and have deceived people for centuries. Verifying provenance of artwork can be extremely difficult. Well, let's compare an NFT, which can take the form of digital artwork, but really is just a technology that can do anything that is required to have authenticity. I'm gonna take a sip of water and let's look at the Nyan cat here for a moment, the image and the slide. So if there's any doubt, this is a very famous GIF of a cat with a Pop-Tart for a body flying through space and leaving a rainbow trail behind it. As I said, you know, art is subjective. But the punchline I wanna make is you can find this image in a million places across the internet and I copy and paste it from Google here. 
Now the creator of this image, however, sold a one of one NFT of this GIF for 300 Ethereum, different kind of digital asset in February. It's worth about a million dollars today with proof of authenticity and ownership. Now, is that crazy? Well, as they say, art is subjective. So who's really to say if that's too much? But in a world where I can find a million pictures of the Mona Lisa on Google, I think we would agree that we attribute some sort of real value to authenticity and something being unique. So is this just internet art? Is that all NFTs are? Pictures of cats with Pop-Tart bodies? Well, the thing that you need to realize, again, is that the concept can go well beyond memes or internet stuff, right? One compelling idea I've come across for NFTs was real estate title. Now, if you ever bought or sold a house, you know that establishing chain of title, in other words, that you're entitled to the property is extremely important, okay? And without getting too much into the law, it's basically to say that you own the thing that you think you're buying and then no one else can come along and say, well, hey, lovely backyard, but I purchased it from someone else 150 years ago and now I'm gonna start mining for oil. Um, what if title existed on a blockchain? What if it was verifiable and permanent? What if all liens, easements, other obligations were all tracked and available in one place as opposed to a county assessor's office um, or on some hundred year old writing somewhere, a contract, crumpled up piece of paper, whatever. Just one potential NFT application. The title to your house could take the form of an NFT with a chain of title shown in permanent blockchain. So how about tickets to an event, performance of a song, a signed baseball trading card? NFTs really have interesting applications for anything that's traditionally subject to forgery, or counterfeiting, among other problems. So why should I care? Well, why does this relate to small businesses at all? Well, here are a couple of things for me to toss out. First, I think blockchain technology offers the possibility for massive efficiency gains in business. Consider for a moment the ways in which your business generates records, refers back to them, and or stores information. Think about all the points in which something could go wrong or might have gone wrong already, or hit a snag, a problem with data entry, human error, you know, one more zero or too few zeros than there should have been, lost records, data corruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Think about the effort that might be required to marshal the data you do store. Receipts, purchase orders, other records, say you get audited, say you want to do your books and records at the end of the year or quarterly. Blockchain presents the opportunity for a data management system that is self-recording and self-verifying with a perfect audit trail. What kind of efficiency gains might that lead to in terms of the ability to quickly reference records, aggregate data, or share those records with others, like an accountant or a business partner? Now, second, I think there are also some real security gains that we need to think about with regard to blockchain. Think again about how you store records for your business. Now, depending on the business, you might have your records online, they might be in the cloud, they might be with a third party, or they might be in a file cabinet, they might be in your desk, they might be in an employee's office or in a briefcase in the back of some employee's car. What potential vulnerabilities exist in that system, whether through electronic access or physical access? What is the vulnerability of someone manipulating those records, whether by making changes to an electronic file, destroying a record or otherwise. Blockchain presents the opportunity for safe, cryptographically secure data storage. Data stored on blockchain can be permanent and extremely tamper resistant with secured copies distributed to many entities as backups. Third, and this is sort of where my mind always goes as a litigator, but think about the potential advantages for resolving disputes here. Now, of course, we have smart contracts we spoke about and how the blockchain is objective. But if you think about this, this really could be significant in terms of establishing facts. And you know, to be clear, in litigation, that's a good chunk of what we do, is just try to figure out the facts and how to apply the law to it. Um, I know this can be maddening for companies, but you know, the blockchain is not going to argue with you about whether a shipment arrived on time or whether someone completed a task. The system can self-populate the data, and you just go from there. You know, as a commercial litigator, I can tell you that Establishing something like whether a shipment really did arrive on time can take months of discovery back and forth, depositions, you know, collection of records, things like that. It's just kind of the nature of the beast. Now, I think that certainty regarding facts, whether through a smart contract or blockchain records, can greatly streamline the resolution of disputes and allow companies to devote less resources to establishing what actually happened when something went wrong. Next, and I'm also going to caution you 
clearly, and this is another disclaimer, this is an area where you're going to want to have specific legal guidance, and I'm not offering any sort of financial advice whatsoever. But you cannot avoid the fact that there are tremendous possibilities the companies are exploring for the use of digital assets as a financial solution. Let's talk about some of those possibilities. One, some companies have explored it as a way of storing value. Now, if you believe that Bitcoin will appreciate in value over the long term, and I'm not passing judgment on that one way or another, it might represent a treasury reserve that has a long term appreciating value as opposed to something depreciating like cash. One individual that's really sort of explored this and given some great talks about it is Michael Saylor of a company called MicroStrategy. He's a thought leader in this area. He's profited handsomely from using Bitcoin as a reserve asset. Likewise, Tesla, you know, a name I think we're all familiar with, invested in and actually sold some Bitcoin um, just recently. The gains, in fact, from their sale of Bitcoin was over $1 billion and actually exceeded what Tesla made from selling all vehicles in 2020. Um, another financial solution is payment method. Um, likewise, you have the opportunity as a business, and many, many businesses are doing this already, to be paid in an asset class used around the world uh, that is quick and has the potential to appreciate over the long run. Now, to be clear, many, many businesses accept Bitcoin and assets as payments, and we're actually seeing employees requesting to be paid in digital assets. Um, you know, for example, NFL players. In fact, number one draft pick Trevor Lawrence uh, just a couple weeks ago reportedly invested his $22 million signing bonus in digital assets. And you're seeing players request to be paid. You're also seeing cities and other sort of organizations offering to pay their employees in digital assets. And I also think we're seeing really interesting things that companies should be thinking about with regard to DeFi. Um, that's another sort of buzzword that's tossed around. It means decentralized finance, but really it's the concept of using digital assets and blockchain to offer traditional financial services, but without a decentralized authority like a bank. What are some examples of DeFi? Well, I mean, they're kind of interesting. Peer-to-peer -peer loans, savings accounts with six, eight, 10% or higher interest, decentralized insurance contracts, synthetic stocks tied to real world underlying securities, um, other concepts. But while I think this area needs to be navigated very carefully, I think we're gonna see more and more businesses look to DeFi, things like peer-to-peer -peer loans to address some of the problems in traditional financial system and some of the problems of people getting access to the traditional financial system. So let's kind of continue that thread and talk about some legal issues. I am in fact a lawyer. Um, this is not all just about Bitcoin and blockchain, but I want to sort of preview some of the things that we're dealing with and some of the interesting concepts which are on the horizon. Um, while the technology has been around for some time, um, mainstream adoption, I believe, of Bitcoin, digital assets, blockchain is really just starting. So what this means from a legal perspective is that the regulatory system really either needs to be one, created from scratch, or two, we're trying to sort of apply old laws to new technology. Now, in my world, we might think of things like the Commodity Exchange Act or the Securities Act of 1933, the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, all, you know, a mouthful. But 1933, 1934, wow, those are almost 100-year-old statutes that we're trying to use to interpret how we treat things like Bitcoin or, you know, a flying uh, cat through space with a Pop-Tart body. As the technology further evolves, so I think does the need for further reaching regulatory schemes. And I'm going to highlight a little bit of what the US is concerned with right now. So one key priority is taxation. Um, just like we saw with internet sales, and I think you know, anyone who's got a business that's, you know, does any internet sales is very familiar with sort of the um, states and the governments of the, the world kind of becoming interest in taxation on those sales. And that's a big deal now. And, you know, 10 years ago, it was less of a big deal. Um, that said, I think the same thing's happening with digital assets. IRS is very, very, very interested in taxing digital assets, but there's still sort of minimal guidance on that area. All the same, you'll see that the 1040 form, which, you know, a lot of you folks might fill out in an individual capacity, has been revised to ask whether you received, sold, sent, exchanged, or otherwise acquired a financial interest in virtual currency. And it's really a big deal. The IRS is now putting a form out there, which a lot of US taxpayers will see, asking if you hold virtual currencies. That was almost unthinkable five years ago. Trading. Um, this is, again, more sort of my wheelhouse, but curbing market manipulation is a priority. 
Some folks might have concern about Bitcoin or other digital assets because they're very, very volatile markets. And that's true. Um, you know, and I think we're going to see sort of the U.S. government work to normalize the market and sort of reduce some of that volatility. But as large institutions amass Bitcoin, I think we're seeing a lot of that now. And market surveillance has increased and the government agencies of the world have gotten much more adept at monitoring these markets and going after folks who abuse them. I think it's a little bit less of a concern than it was a few years ago. Um, likewise, I, I would say there's a huge focus on unregistered securities offerings in the form of digital assets. You know, the extent that you're a business and you're considering, you know, I'm going to go invent the Butzel coin or, or some sort of other digital asset, you really, really need to tread carefully and seek legal guidance. Um, the SEC has clearly established that they will move quickly and forcefully to enjoin the offering of digital assets offered to U.S. citizens that they deem to be securities. Um, payments and transactions, I touched upon that a little bit already, but you know, what do we do about a financial system that doesn't require the involvement of highly regulated and monitored brick and mortar financial institutions? Things like money laundering, financing of terrorism and other suspicious activities. The traditional financial system has things to stay ahead of that bad conduct. AML, KYC, know your customer, other regulations and oversight. Similar safeguards don't necessarily exist in this space or if they do, they're kind of coming together now and we're learning as we go. FinCEN, among other organizations, are very active in this space and will continue to be. Um, use in ransomware, that's another interesting consideration. And to you know, do a shameless plug, we actually are gonna have a um, webinar coming up in just a week or so at Bustle um, that talks about ransomware and what to do if your company has to deal with digital assets in that capacity. But suffice it to say, far more illicit activity takes place in cash than in Bitcoin, but Criminals still have, over time, used digital assets to facilitate bad conduct. Um, you know, one cannot deny that past. What do we do about that? What do we do about digital assets that, unlike Bitcoin, which, you know, don't tell a criminal, but actually is, can be tracked and reverse engineered to figure out who sent and received it? What do you do about assets like Monero? Um, Monero is a digital currency that was designed to be extremely difficult to track or to identify the sender of funds, the amount of the recipient. Should that be illegal? If so, who gets to say? Money transfer is another issue. Um, most folks may not understand this, but if you're in business, you, you probably do. If you send funds internationally or domestically, it, it will almost certainly be through a network of traditional financial institutions like SWIFT or ACH. Um, but what happens when what businesses and individuals are able to facilitate the transfer of funds outside of that framework? Do they need money transmitter licenses or state licenses? If so, what states? Who gets to say? Now, in the United States, there's different jurisdictions with different approaches. This has caused legal uncertainty that we're still trying to figure out. Um, other issues include uh, DeFi. You know, I touched upon that a little bit, but what do we do about things like peer-to-peer -peer loans? I mean, loans and extending credit, those are highly regulated industries. What if, you know, you're in a position where somebody can go and loan your business uh, X amount of funds? How do we regulate that? A lot of legal issues I think we're only starting to think about, but charitable giving, estate planning, bankruptcy, gambling, gaming, um, these are some of them. And we're really just starting to sort of scratch the surface. So how do we handle this? Well, generally speaking, we see that the regulators of the world have taken a handful of approaches, and I'll talk about the US. Um, you know, one option is you leave it unregulated and you create a friendly regulatory system. Spain, Luxembourg, these are examples of that. Some countries actually created their own digital asset. Venezuela has the Petro coin. Um, you might ban it. That's something some countries have done. Morocco, Pakistan, India has famously banned cryptocurrency several times. Um, Nigeria. Um, certain aspects of virtual currency might also be banned, like ICOs. That's the initial coin offerings I talked about. Um, or you could do what the U.S. is doing, which is try to regulate it. Either create laws for virtual currency or attempt to conform pre-existing regulations to this new tech. But in the United States, and I think this is sort of obvious, we see this tension, right, between wanting to bring regulation and order to this space for any variety of reasons and wanting to foster and promote innovation. And this is sort of a common refrain for new tech, disruptive things, right? I mean, think about Uber, think about Lyft. These were sort of game changers for a lot of big cities, but had to be reconciled and merged with rules and laws or like around taxis. Are they the same? Is a chauffeur the same? Whether they're driving an Uber or a livery vehicle, 
That's sort of happening now. Um, and it's not clear that the reconciliation is working that well. A lot of virtual currency trade occurs outside the US. Many businesses will go out of their way and businesses in the digital asset space, I should say, to avoid the US market and to bar US customers. And we also have this weird sort of interplay between federal and state, which you know is inherent to our government and usually it's just worked out over time. Um, we have our federal regulators, the SEC, the CFTC, FinCEN, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And then the state, we have everybody. Uh, it's a free for all. Every state has a different approach. Um, it's sort of up to them to determine what they want to do. And this gets really thorny with money transmission laws. So again, this is an area that I raise to the extent that a small business is thinking about using digital assets, you wanna go and get guidance. These questions aren't insurmountable. It's just to say that these questions should be on your radar and you should tread thoughtfully in this area. Um, Hawaii is one example. They broadly classify virtual currencies as money and that makes them subject to the state's money transmitter regulations. On the other hand, Texas is the first state to clarify that virtual currencies are not subject to money transmitter licenses because they're not money. Those are two jurisdictions with completely different interpretations. Some states have attempted to apply their blue sky laws, their security laws to virtual currencies like New York, it's Martin Act. Um, but then at the same time, you see states like Florida, which, you know, sort of, uh, this isn't with a lot of states, they establish a task force and really it's sort of an exploratory effort to understand the technology. Um, you know, goals there expand blockchain industry in the state to bring in more tax dollars, to recommend policies and state investments to help, you know, make that state a leader in blockchain technology and maybe even to study how it, blockchain might benefit governmental entities for like record keeping, like that city assessor office, like I talked about, county assessor office. All right. Um, and that represent that is really representative of what a lot of states have done. Um, you know, many states have also enacted or proposed some form of regulation in this space. I think that's only going to continue as time passes and widespread adoption increases. And this is already somewhat difficult to navigate. While some have proposed a uniform approach, it hasn't really been the case thus far, but that might change. Um, so let's talk about how this all fits together and let's get off sort of the boring legal stuff here. So digital assets in the news. These are just a few recent headlines that I think are interesting, and I'm going to sort of work through them quickly. Um, this is a great one. So these two headlines relate to JP Morgan. The first is from September 2017, and the second is from this January. So first, Jamie Dimon says Bitcoin is a fraud that will eventually blow up. Next, Jamie, not Jamie Morgan, Dimon, JP Morgan says Bitcoin could rise to $146,000 long term as it competes with gold. What these headlines really demonstrate is a growing recognition in the financial industry that digital assets have legitimate investment value and are here to say. Notably, we're seeing that traditional financial institutions like the JP Morgan's of the world, Fidelity, Goldman Sachs are now looking to digital assets like Bitcoin, both for their own accounts and in response to customer demand. And there's a lot of slides like this, you know, on one hand, this is bad, like I touched on earlier, to this is good, this is something we want to learn more about. Here's some more. Uh, stepping back a little bit, these are interesting headlines because we're seeing that extremely well-established historically conservative institutions are taking a hard look at digital assets as well. So we have um, Mass Mutual, it's up on my screen here, so I keep looking up. This is founded in 1851. Alexander Hamilton was actually a shareholder of the pre-merger Bank of New York and my beloved University of Michigan at the bottom there has been around since 1817. You know, these are not institutions which are fast to adopt whatever is just the fad of the moment. Um, it's also interesting that institutions like Harvard, Yale, Stanford, MIT, Brown, Dartmouth, they've all invested in some hard digital assets. Uh, next slide. So these headlines touch upon the US state and federal interests we discussed earlier. Uh, on the one hand, we're seeing here with Wyoming states that are competing to attract new investment and tax dollars from digital assets and blockchain businesses. Notably, Wyoming has actually emerged as a leader in crypto friendly regulations and the Senator there, uh, Cynthia Lummis, is both a Bitcoin holder and a member of the Senate Banking Committee. And on the other hand, we see that the federal government is very interested in protection, right? On the one hand, you have innovation, bringing businesses in, making a friendly regulatory environment, and this pressure at the same time to protect investors, to protect digital asset users, to protect 
um, everyone from the illicit uses of digital assets. And that's what this sort of bottom headline touches on. Let's talk about US first internationally. Um, you know, India, as I mentioned, has repeatedly moved to prohibit digital assets, but we're seeing that the nature of the technology makes it very difficult to actually do this in practice. I mentioned Nigeria actually moved to curtail the use of Bitcoin in its country not too long ago, but what actually happened was the use of Bitcoin exploded as awareness spread and more people started talking about it. Um, indeed, in countries that have their fiat currency devalued from inflation, many have flocked to Bitcoin and other digital assets as a hedge and also as a way of moving currency out of the country. Um, it's interesting to think of, but I mean, it's you actually will see refugees with digital assets. That's not something which is completely crazy. Um, here in the States, we're seeing a lot of interest in what the Unions administration will do with digital assets. And I think it's tough to say, but I generally think we're going to see the same kind of competing interests that I've touched upon throughout this webinar and what we saw with the last administration. For example, the previous administration made some real headway in the adoption of digital assets through, for example, a pro OCC office as office of, of the comptroller of the currency. And that agency was led by a man named Brian Brooks, who before heading the OCC was the chief legal officer at Coinbase, which is a very large US exchange where you can buy and sell digital assets. But under Mr. Brooks' leadership, the OCC provided clarity, a much needed clarity, I would say, to US banks looking at transacting digital assets that might well continue with this new administration. At the same time, the Department of Justice over the last administration repeatedly expressed concern over the use of digital assets and illicit activity, that protection threat. The SEC and the CFTC initiating a number of actions related to investor and market protection. So I think the administration here will likely continue to make cautious progress, um, but it's worth noting that there are a number of nominees or now appointees um, for critical positions that have really strong crypto backgrounds. For example, uh, the US SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, is now headed by Gary Gensler. He taught courses at MIT on digital assets, blockchain, and policy. The leading candidate for the CFTC chair is likewise extremely well-versed in digital assets and central bank digital currencies. That's a term that I think you're gonna hear more about. It's basically a government-issued digital asset. Um, and so on and so forth. So at the next slide here, let's talk again about business. Um, you know, in business, we're seeing sort of the promise and the pitfalls of digital assets. Kia was in the news not too long ago when their website was hacked and held ransom for Bitcoin. Um, the use of digital assets and crime is going to continue to be an area of intense law enforcement focus. And I think companies that are big enough to be a target need to think about, you know, how do we interact with digital assets if that's the world that we're living in? Um, on the other hand, Tesla, as I mentioned, made news by both buying Bitcoin as an investment on its balance sheet and recently accepting Bitcoin as payment for its vehicles. This has actually paid off very well, as I said, for Tesla. Um, and they recently announced that they actually intend to hold a good chunk of their Bitcoin as a long-term appreciating value, or what they think is going to be a uh, sort of long-term appreciating store of value. This is another sort of interesting topic. Um, Facebook holds the cryptocurrency, hopes the cryptocurrency it backs will launch in 2021. Some of you might remember Facebook's attempt to launch a Libra coin or more recently DM. Um, but if you're not familiar, really it, all this is saying is that not too long ago, Facebook attempted or announced that they would be issuing a digital asset of their own. And I can't really describe it any other way of saying it short, it triggered a governmental firestorm. Um, there were congressional hearings, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, marched up the hill to Congress. A bill was introduced to prevent social media companies from issuing assets, and it spurred really a broader discussion about how we should be regulating private businesses that seek to issue digital assets. Why? Well, I mean, think about it. Facebook has over 2 billion active users around the world. Never before had the governments of the world been confronted with the possibility that a private company like Facebook could overnight roll out a financial instrument, a currency, if you will, to 2.5 billion people. For better or for worse, I think Facebook was really just the first through the door on this. So let's talk about takeaways here. Um, and with the caveat that none of this is investment advice or legal advice, here's what I think we're gonna see in the remainder of 2021. Um, increased regulation aimed at bringing stability to digital asset markets and curbing manipulation and other bad acts. I think that is going to be very important. I think we're going to see long awaited governmental actions that will give some clarity to businesses looking to enter this space, and retail investors looking to gain exposure to digital assets. 
I think we're going to see the first US Bitcoin exchange traded fund approved this year, uh, or ETF. Um, and I think we're going to see state by state approaches to digital assets kind of continue to cause confusion. We might see federal preemption, which just means that the US government steps in and declares that they have control over this area of the law. Maybe not. Um, I think we're going to see more announcements from businesses that Bitcoin has been sort of integrated on their balance sheets or used for their business. And I think we're going to see sort of increased adoption of digital assets and blockchain and finance and business. Just a few more examples. I mean, Visa, other credit card companies have already started to roll out credit cards offering Bitcoin rewards. They've worked to allow Bitcoin payments wherever companies like Visa, you know, credit card is accepted. PayPal not too long ago announced that their users would be able to use digital asset holdings to pay for goods and services of all 29 million online merchants that use PayPal. And I think large companies are going to continue exploring digital assets of their own, like Facebook did, and one will break through eventually. So a lot of interesting business applications here. And while I've talked about big business, you know, a lot of this was applicable to small business as well. Um, but in closing, if you're paying attention now, if you took the time to sit on a webinar to learn what Bitcoin is, learn what blockchain is, start to think about these topics and how they might advantage your business, differentiate your business, or allow you, you know, market share that you might not have right now, I think you're still very early to this technology. Where it's going to go is anybody's guess, but, you know, I like to say there was always sort of the first business that put a website up, right? I mean, there was always the first person who decided to sell stuff online. And I mean, many have likened digital assets and blockchain, I think rightly so, to the internet in terms of its development. If this kind of continues the way it is, I think this is going to be a technology that is here to stay. And if so, you know, good on you for, for trying to learn a little bit about it now. So uh, I will go and take any questions here. I, I see, Lori, we've got one here um, in addition to whatever other ones you already have. Yep, I have a couple here. Uh, and I just wanted to say this is extremely interesting, Bill. Uh, one of our viewers on Facebook, Amy, said fascinating and that she never thought she would say that about banking. So um, you took a very interesting topic and, and shared it with us. So thank you. Um, you do have the one question there that I think it was from Sheila. And I believe she asked how, why it took so long to mine the Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, let me just read the question here. Can you explain how Bitcoin is created? Mine, please. And why does it take so much energy to create? Yeah, I mean, we touched upon this a little bit. Um, and if the question was posed before the mining slide, I didn't realize it, apologies. But to briefly sort of go over it. Um, so Bitcoin is mined, excuse me, um, by mining farms, by computers, by anyone who has access to the Bitcoin blockchain and is running what's called a node. And it's basically available to anyone. You'll find that your computer is doing this sort of very energy intensive work. I mean, if you've ever gone and you've got 10 PowerPoints open or slides, you know, Excel decks, you know, you get a little fan going crazy in the background. Well, that's because your processor is working really hard. Essentially, in Bitcoin's blockchain, the processor is working to solve a mathematical equation using all of its power, right? And it's complex. It's supposed to be complex. And if you get it right and you're the first person to solve the puzzle, you're rewarded with Bitcoin that has very real value. Now, needless to say, this has become a very big business, okay? And I would not, I uh, said so I would not give advice. I'm gonna give a little bit of advice. I would not encourage anybody who is not a complete professional to even think about mining Bitcoin at this point. Um, it is very, very competitive and well-financed. But what we see, and this is really interesting, is you're, you're actually having folks, businesses, sidle up next to power plants. I'm not making this up. Hydroelectric plants, sources of renewable energy, actually. Um, you know, mining and sort of reusing solar power, emissions, stuff like that to power these computers where energy is cheap. And they need cheap energy to sort of make this cost effective because it's so expensive to run these processors to mine Bitcoin and to be competitive, to have a chance to win, to get the Bitcoin, which you can then sell. So why does it take so much energy to create? Well, for the reasons I stated, right? If you had, imagine, 10 laptops in your house instead of one, or 100 computers in your office instead of five, you know, and they all were running at max speed all the time, it's like all the lights are on, your energy bill is going to be high. Um, and we, we sort of see these interesting things as an aside from time to time. You know, I, there was 
I don't want to get the country wrong, but there was a country in which it was basically discovered that folks had gone and set up shop within a government run nuclear power plant. And they were using the power from the nuclear power plant to run mining rigs. I think it was like Iran or um, perhaps Russia. But one, whoever it was, they figured this out, they confiscated the equipment, and then they, they basically turned it back on to mine Bitcoin for the benefit of the government. So um, that's the energy thing. And, and sort of touch on a topic that's a little bit of a, you know, Bitcoin is bad thought is, okay, this is really bad for the environment. This is horrible. Think about all these computers running all the time. Well, the fact of the matter is U.S., use, consumer use of washing machines actually exceeds the global energy consumption of Bitcoin. And moreover, Bitcoin as a sheer sort of dollar and cents matter are trying to go and use energy that is surplusage, that is close to the source, that is in excess, that cannot be used. And they're actually leading the way in trying to adopt renewable energy sources to make this cheaper. So again, it's sort of a, you know, it's a do your own research area, but the takeaway is you know, I don't think it's nearly as, as sort of bad. It's not boiling the oceans like some folks would tell you. Right. Well, you know, that kind of leads into, I appreciated you starting with the misconceptions. I thought that was very important and, and it looks like energy consumption uh, could be one of those. Uh, the next one it kind of leads me to is, will the U.S. government make Bitcoin illegal? Yeah, yeah, so that's a real good question. Um, in short, and again, I don't have a crystal ball, right? Um, and I can only sort of advise on, on what I understand is the law right now and, and where things are, but I, I don't think so. Um, Hester Peirce, which is, uh, you know, lovingly called crypto mom, she's a commissioner at the SEC, extremely high ranking government official, um, you know, basically touched upon this not too long ago. And her comments were, it is very, very difficult to ban peer to peer technology. And I think that speaks not necessarily to whether the US would want to ban it. I don't think they do. I, I think they want it encourage innovation. I think the US consistently tries to be a leader in technology and innovation, right? But also, you know, and I, I liken this sometimes back to airplanes, like there was a time in which you could go get a mail order kit, build an airplane and go, you know, shoot it down your cornfield and go fly around for a while. And it's like, did we, is that better, you know, or do we like the FAA? Do we like, you know, air traffic controllers? It gets to a point where it's complex enough and a system has to work together in a way that I think we actually want regulation, not just because I'm a lawyer and I benefit from, you know, the work it, it develops, but I think it's better for everybody. And I think that's the US position. I think they want to regulate it. I think that they see that we've got some brilliant minds here. I think there's a real business case for it. I think it's going to bring tax dollars. I don't think the US wants to ban it. And moreover, it's really hard to ban. We saw that with Nigeria. They tried to ban it. And then folks said, oh, I read about Bitcoin in the newspaper. I got to go look into this. And then they went and got some anyway. And how do you prevent that? Do you ban all the exchanges? This is a decentralized technology. You can go and, and set up a transaction with anybody directly in the world. How do you go and, and sort of block that? The cat's already out of the bag. So I, I don't think it's going to get banned in short. Well, that sounds like uh, you know what you're talking about, and that kind of leads to Michigan. Is there legislation? Uh, are there things on the books about uh, digital assets that we should know? Anything coming on the pike? Yeah. So, I mean, Michigan has sort of tracked the same kind of progress that we've seen a lot of states do. Um, you know, it's not to say that they've wholeheartedly adopted it. You know, Michigan isn't the next crypto hub, but at the same time, they haven't banned it either. Um, you know, they've gone and they've amended some of their statutes, some of the, you know, the laws that we have to work within as lawyers um, to make clear that virtual currencies are included in things like, you know, Michigan Penal Code to make clear that, you know, if you do something illegal with digital assets, that you can be covered by the law. It's really sort of this clarifying guidance. I think the Department of Treasury has also issued a little bit of guidance about how state tax applies when digital assets are used. And, you know, we've got a little bit of guidance on the Money Transmitter Act within Michigan and how we, you know, classify digital assets and what obligations might go with that. But, you know, it's sort of this, you know, we're going to dip our toes in the water a little bit. We're going to show that we're thinking about it, but not yet, you know, dive in one way or another. And that's kind of common, um, you know, for states. Right. We're good. Bill, I don't see any other questions and it looks like we are at time. Thank you again. Very interesting subject. I hope to hear more from you. We'd like to have you back again.
Thank you so much for your time. And thank you to everyone that joined us today. This will be recorded and you will find it on Facebook and on the SBAM website. Yeah, thank you again, Lori. Thank you, you know, SBAM for having me and um, it's a real pleasure to speak with everybody, you know, out in cyberspace. Thank you for attending. Great, thank you everyone. Bye-bye.